Hello again everyone, it's me Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. I would like to start this video off today by firstly thanking everyone who has been supporting my channel financially via either Patreon, PayPal or subscription as a member to my channel. It truly does mean a lot and thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. All the contributions you're making towards my channel are helping to improve it so it really does mean a lot and uh, thank you again. So we are today talking about combat aviation and helicopters. This particular helicopter I have actually flown on and I have a huge respect for it. Sadly, it's no longer in service, however, its history and aviation prestige really does give it a massive, massive level of respect. The Lynx helicopter, incredible bit of kit, the most agile, versatile and somewhat just badass little helicopter that the British Armed Forces has used for some time. But not just the British, it's been kind of capitalised in other countries as well. It has been a world leader of helicopters, operating in challenging environments at sea, in the wastes of the Antarctica, in the heat of the Arabian Gulf, and just about everywhere. The Westland Lynx may lack a modern digital cockpit, it may be oily and battle scarred, but for those who have flown it and maintained it, this most versatile of aircraft for more than four decades, it is still being mourned in its passing. The Lynx has been a key asset to the Army Air Corps for just over 38 years, along with the Royal Navy, having first taken to the skies in June 1977 as the Lynx AH-1. Throughout the long and illustrious career of the Lynx, it has seen services in over 22 active conflicts, including Operation Agricola in Kosovo, Operation Banner in Northern Ireland, and more recently, of course, Operation Herrick in Afghanistan. It has been in service with 17 different Army Air Corps squadrons, as well as being operated by numerous other users, both within the UK, including Empire Test Pilot School, or Rotary Wing Test and Evaluation Squadron, and many other overseas forces with foreign nations. The first real test for the Lynx was in 1982, when a number were being deployed to the South Atlantic to, of course, the Falklands War. Sadly, three of these aircraft never came home, as the ships that were being carried on were actually sunk by the Argentine Air Force. The following year, the Lynx was used alongside other British helicopters to evacuate British nationals from war-torn Beirut. Since then, they have been used in action ever since, protecting British shipping interests in the Persian Gulf, in action against Iraqi fast patrol boats in the Gulf in 1991, supporting operations in Sierra Leone and in Northern Ireland, and protecting shipping from all pirates off the coast of Somalia. The life of the Lynx helicopter began right back in the mid-1960s, when the requirement for a helicopter to replace the aging Westland Scout arose. From this, development of the Lynx occurred very rapidly, with the first flight on March 21st, 1971. It was then a further six years before the first operational Lynx went into service with the Army Air Corps, whom eventually took delivery of 113 Lynx AH-1 examples. Little was known at this stage as to how successful this helicopter would prove for the British Army and the Army Air Corps. It was also during this time that the Westland's modified G-Lynx demonstrator broke the world speed record for a helicopter by flying at 249 miles per hour, a record to this day which has not been broken, not counting records set by Sikorsky X2 or Eurocopter X3, which as compound designs do not qualify for true helicopter speed records. 
The Lynx proved a particularly agile and versatile helicopter for the Army Air Corps, for whom it was able to perform key roles to support the British Army. Battlefield utility, limited intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance, Kazavak, escort as well as anti-tank roles using 8 tow missiles, a capability fitted to 60 aircraft of the fleet, were all roles of the Westland Lynx AH, which was performed very well during its time of its 38 year service life. The Lynx was often referred to as the jack of all trades, and rightly so, because of the sheer number of roles that it was able to fulfil successfully. The Westland Lynx also proved to be a big hit at any air show, given its ability to perform a backflip. Yes, the helicopter could do a complete barrel roll, or completely invert upside down and rotate back into normal flight. This was for a while a unique manoeuvre for the Lynx, which was able to perform the backflip from hover positioning. This manoeuvre can now be performed, however, by other helicopters with rigid or semi-rigid main rotor systems, such as the BO-105 and the AH-64 Apache, when the longbow radar is not equipped, because obviously you don't want to rip it off. It's not something you really want to do acrobatics in anyway. The Lynx underwent one major upgrade program from the AH-1 to the current Lynx-7. This was a significant upgrade to the original Mark I helicopter, providing new, more powerful engines, uprated gearboxes, and a new, larger composite tail rotor and new main rotor blades, which together all offered significantly greater performance. As part of this upgrade program, 107 Lynx AH-1s were converted with the Army Air Corps purchasing a further 12 build Lynx AH-7 helicopters to supplement the fleet. Outwardly, the Lynx featured a forward cockpit area behind the nose. The assembly for the pilot and the co-pilot seated in a side-by-side -side arrangement with a cabin directly behind. Cabin access was quite large and was made possible by two windowed cabin doors along either side of the fuselage. The twin turboshaft engines were mounted behind and above the cabin, powered by a very, very capable four-blade semi-rigid main rotor component along with a four-blade tail rotor on the tailport side. Both blade systems were arranged in a cruciform pattern, while the composite tail rotor spins in the opposite direction to reduce operational noise. The main rotor was mounted on a forged titanium hub, and the aircraft needed to be extremely strong in its components to allow it to fulfil its extremely agile and somewhat acrobatic or aerobatic role. The undercarriage could be a traditional skid system or three-wheeled retractable undercarriage. Interestingly, when the aircraft was primarily designed for the naval trials, the three-wheeled system actually had a locking feature, and when you look at the aircraft trying to sit on top of the deck of a ship, it's incredible that it holds in place, and that's because the aircraft was very, very much designed upon having the ability to lock onto the deck. That's right, the wheels, when they bounced onto the deck, had an extremely powerful suspension system, and once actually seated on the platform of the deck, there was actually a hook that latched into certain modules upon the deck of the ship to hold it in place, which is why you always wonder, how the hell does that aircraft actually hold onto the deck? And that's exactly how it did it. Armament for the Lynx varied depending on its role that it was to play. The aircraft had a huge naval capability too. Anti-submarine versions had provisions for two torpedoes, Mark 44, 46, A244S and Stingray types, two times Mark 11 depth charges and dipping sonar systems. Active surface variants could field four times anti-ship missiles, the Sea Skewer, the British Navy variant, and the AS-12 wire-guided French Navy missile. For basic army attack use, the aircraft could be fitted with two impressive 20mm cannons on the fuselage sides, two times 70mm rocket pods or eight times tow anti-tank guided missile pods could also be put onto the aircraft, four launch tubes to each side as required, and surprisingly those pods could actually be changed in flight. For all other general purpose battlefield use, the Lynx could also be defended with a crew with the operated Pintle mounted machine guns and the GPMG 7.62mm. The cabin space of the aircraft was approximately 5.2 meters cubed and could accommodate up to 9 troops. Up to 1,360 kilograms of cargo could be underslung from an external cargo hook for ship to shore and ship to ship replacement. The Lynx was powered by two very powerful Rolls Royce Gem 42 1 turboshaft engines, which each provide 835 shaft horsepower. The fully developed Gem Mark 42 engines are fitted on the British, French, Danish, and Netherlands and Norwegian Lynx helicopters. The Gem is a fully capable engine for sea and operational use in erosive and corrosive environments, from desert and tropical conditions to freezing and arctic environments, and of course the sea salt air.
Superlinks 200 and 300 are fitted with the CTS 800 4N turboshaft engines with the LHTC, which have full authority digital engine control. Unfortunately, the aircraft being so impressive through its time will always have an end, and however, it's really an obvious fact of life that the times move on, and technology evolves, and even the Lynx, that great bastion of the skies, can be taken over by a rapid pace of technological change. For Lynx, the journey from analogue to digital proved one flight too far, setting it upon its final course towards its decommission from the British military life, and paving the way for the Wildcats' arrival. The iconic Lynx helicopter, the backbone of the British Army and Royal Navy alike, took a final flypast across the skies of southern England in 2018, ending in a V-shaped air procession along the River Thames in central London to mark its formal retirement from a career spanning some 40 years of active service. Although the 31st of July 2018 marks the retirement of the Westland Lynx AH-7, it's clear that the Army Air Corps will still keep a strong aviation presence with the introduction of the Augusta Westland AW-159 Wildcat AH-1. The Lynx may be gone in name, but its legacy on the incredible Wildcat will live on for a lot longer. So hopefully, guys, you learned a little bit about this aircraft. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed flying on it when I was in the British Army. I got a couple of flights. Uh, it is fast. Uh, I mean, I'm not a helicopter pilot, so I don't know what fast is. But I was inside of that thing. We're traveling across the, uh, the Polish countryside. I was like, damn, this thing is whippy. It is flying pretty nif. Um, across the sky and the gazelle that I also flew in um, was quite fast but when you're comparing apples to oranges this thing was just insane we had probably about eight fully loaded troops in there uh, and for the most part it was just flying I was like oh my life this thing is quick and I just enjoyed the capability that it had to drop us in and out fast and and you know having all of our kit fully loaded and it wasn't uncomfortable we could all fit in there quite happily and had no problems and I know many people who have operated with links uh, really enjoyed it in fact uh, a person that I know who works at my unit his father was a pilot of one using the anti-tank uh, weapon systems on there which is pretty badass I would love to see this thing launching some toes at some t-72s for sure anyway thank you so much for joining me today I'd like to once again thank everyone who has been supporting me um, via contributions and donations to my channel via both Patreon on paypal and subscription thank you so much from every portion of my heart it really does mean a lot um, if you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future please click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified for next content coming out you can also check out the description box below if you do want to support me on patreon paypal and etc and there's also my social media links in there too thank you again i hope you have a wonderful day all the best bye bye